here's the, here's the scene. A person walks up to an elevator. They hit the down button, stand there and wait. They hit the down button about five more times because they believe there's a secret sensor that if you push the button more than one times, the elevator goes faster. They stand there and wait. Finally, the doors open up. They go inside the elevator. You got the little ding noise. The arrow comes on. Doors open. They walk inside the elevator, hit the first floor, spin around, and they're standing there right now with the elevator doors open. They see off in the distance a person who's walking kind of towards them pretty quickly, who is staring at the elevator, and they know in their mind this person is probably trying to get here to get on the elevator with me. So they very casually reach over and hit the closed door button two or three times because they don't want to wait and they don't want the person to ride the elevator with them. According to a YouGov American survey last year, at the end of last year, a third of all Americans said, yes, I've done that. I've been on the elevator, and I see someone coming my direction, probably wanting to get on board, and I hit the closed door button because I didn't want them to ride with me, and I didn't want to wait around. Some of you look like you're busted right now, but <laughs> 50% of Americans say, I believe that's happened to me. They say, I was the one going towards an elevator. The doors were open, and I believe rather than holding the door open for me, they made the elevator door shut because they didn't want me to get on board with them. What a great way to love your neighbor, huh? Whether it's on elevators or every day of life on this planet, if you know and believe to Jesus, selfishly shutting the door in other people's faces is not what we're about. Jesus' people are not selfish people. We're to be selfless people. Matter of fact, we're the sort of people that invite people into our world, even at expense to us. Following Jesus means we hold the elevator doors open. It means that we put ourselves, others, ahead of ourselves. The joy of the Christian life is to be like Jesus and to selflessly give our life away serving others. Some of you are so miserable in your life. You know why? It's not your spouse's fault. It's not your job's fault because all you do is think about yourself. It's all you do. God's got a much joyful, better plan than that. We put others ahead of ourselves. This is part six of our series called Overjoyed, 14 messages going through the entire book of Philippians. Part six, here's our title, The Joy of a Selfless Life. The Joy of a Selfless Life. Overjoyed means joy over and over again. And you would think the last guy having an overjoyed life would be the Apostle Paul, who's sitting as a prisoner of Rome in Rome, but it's just the opposite See, there's no secret here. Paul has Jesus, and when you have Jesus, you have the joy of Jesus inside of you. And his life is hard. It's not easy, but nothing can take away his joy. Because Paul knows what we know. It's what the book of Philippians is all about. Hey, we might not always be happy in our circumstances, but if we have Jesus, we always have a reason for joy in Jesus Christ. So this message is about if you've lost your joy... And wow, in our culture, how easily that can happen. In case you haven't noticed, we are living in a divisive, nasty, mean-spirited, hateful culture. And that vortex can get us caught up in it to where we start having that sort of attitude where what it means to be whatever is to be mean and nasty and hateful and sarcastic and divisive and all those sort of things. Again, that is not God's plan. Um, we, we are not called to do that. We're called to be people of joy and know the joy of a selfless life. If you've lost your joy, man, it's time to get it back. And we, we want to go through 14 weeks. We're going to dive pretty deep to see how can, you, how can your marriage find the joy that God intends for you in your marriage? How can this church experience the joy that God intends for us? What about your heart, school, work, just doing the daily living of life? What's that joy and all the ups and downs and struggles and difficulties? How can we have joy? Not happiness, but joy in the midst of all of that. So now we're entering chapter 2. Here's what's going on in chapter 2. Paul absolutely loves the church at Philippi. 
Again, the Philippi is a Roman colony where 10 years earlier, Paul and a guy named Silas planted the church there, and he loves this church. The church of Philippi, it's his sweetheart. It's truly one of the greatest churches in the entire New Testament. They are a great church, and God is doing great things in that church, and Paul wants to make sure that the church continues to stay great. So he started talking about this at the end of chapter 1, and he dives in full-blown in chapter 2. He's saying this, listen, God is doing great things in the church. You are a great church. I want you to stay a great church. And the only way that's going to happen is the church has to have unity and harmony. He's talking about that the church has to be united. You, You have to have harmony. And he says the only way that a church has unity and harmony, we're going to see this, is that believers cannot be selfish and proud like the world around them. We must be selfless and humble like Christ. That's how we have unity and harmony in the church. And as Paul is discussing this with them, he's telling them this is the joy of a selfless life. Now, when I say selfless life, let's know what we mean here Selfless life does not mean we think less of ourselves. Selfless does not mean I hate me, would someone please punch me in the head? That's not what we're talking about. Selfless means we think of self less. We willingly put ourselves in the back seat and we put Jesus and other people ahead of us in all areas of life, always in line with Scripture. We put other people ahead of us. Out of the gate. What we're talking about today, a other's first selfless life, it is not easy. This is not easy stuff today. It absolutely flies in the face of everything our old nature is about, because our old nature is it's all about me, self. This absolutely flies in the face. It is radically counter to what our culture champions, where it's always about number one. And how that comes into the life of the church where people approach church every day of their life. It's all about me, what I like, what I want. How can you serve me? How can you please me? How can it be about me, 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 me? This is hard stuff to do. And so what we see here, though, there's no way to have an overjoyed life without a a selfless life. So this is what I'm praying today for me through this message. And you can join me in this prayer if you want to. I'm saying in this American church culture we have, grateful for it. Jesus, please rescue me from a comfortable, empty, self-centered existence. I don't want that. The joy of a selfless life. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I would ask you to open your Bibles there. Keep them there. Everything's coming from these 11 verses. That's how we do every message. If you're physically able, would you stand while we read God's Word? I want us to see all 11 verses together before we break them down. I want us to get the full picture. As I read this, keep in mind he's talking about unity in the church, unity in this church. And it splashes over to unity in our families and those sort of things. Unity and harmony, a selfless life. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others as better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And verse 11, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We confess that Jesus is Lord right now. Amen? Because he is. You may be seated. Three lessons for living about the joy of a selfless life. Keep your Bibles open. The first lesson for living is from verses 1 and 2. 
A selfless life brings unity. A selfless life that puts others first, puts self in the back seat, it brings unity. You see, unity in the church, again, a selfless life brings unity, our first lesson for living. Unity in the church is not about you looking at me and me looking at you and us looking at each other. It's about us together looking to the Lord. To have unity in the church, we don't focus in our relationships with each other. We focus in our relationship with Jesus. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's pointing them not to their relationship with each other. Again, he said, you're a great church and God is doing great things. I want you to stay great. Satan would love nothing more than to blow the church at Philippi to pieces. He says, you've got to have unity and harmony. And the way to do that is don't look at each other, look at Jesus. We see in verse 1, he gives us the motive for our unity. The motive for our unity. You're going to notice the word if is found four times in this verse. The word if is a class condition. He's not questioning it. It's another way of saying it is a fact. So there's four things listed here with the word if, which means it's a fact, about the motive for our unity as a church. He says, if there is any consolation in love, he says, you can have unity because it's a fact. You have the same salvation. If there is any comfort of love, he says, you can have unity because it's a fact that you have comfort in your life because Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. He says, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, he says, you can have unity because it's a fact that you have the same power of the Holy Spirit working inside of each and every one of you. And he says, you can have unity. It's a fact if there's any affection or mercy. You can have unity. It's a fact because you all have the same compassion in the unconditional love of Jesus in your life. He says, listen, you can have unity. He says, because you've got the same salvation. You've got the same Jesus who's always faithful, will never leave you, will comfort you, whatever you face. You've got the same power of the Holy Spirit of God working inside of you, and you've got the compassion and unconditional love of Christ himself. That's why he says in verse 2, he says, fulfill my joy. It's a command. You see, when there's unity and harmony in the church, it's a joyful thing. If you've ever been a part of a church that was fussing and fighting and feuding, I guarantee one thing about it, you weren't joyful. If you've ever been a part of a church where every time your car hit the parking lot, your stomach hit your shoes, and every time you walked into the building, you hope, man, I hope I don't run into old Mr. Grouch face who was baptized in embalming fluid, you know? If you've ever been in that situation, I promise you, you won't have joy. We love preachers in this church. We bring in young pastors every year, and it breaks my heart, some of the young pastors who, instead of being excited about getting out the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life, every time they walk into the building, they face a war. Somewhere between 40 and 70 percent, it's all over the place, 40 to 70 percent of congregations are in conflict with one another. You're looking at one joyful preacher because I've been here 19 years and we don't do that stuff around here Gerald Davis was here three decades 30 years before me we're coming up on 50 years that this church has had peace and unity and harmony and it's only because of God and we take that seriously once in a while we'll get someone who will bounce into this building and they're not used to that all they've ever known in their life is fighting and fussing and feuding and they find out really quick that doesn't happen here They will carry me out in a body bag as your pastor before I'll allow that to happen in this church. We're going to protect this church. Some of you think I'm joking. He says, here's the method of unity in verse 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He says, here is how we have this unity as a church. He says, we're a selfless. We have a oneness of mind. Look, being like-minded, it doesn't mean we're robots. It doesn't mean we all like the color blue and Rocky Road's our favorite ice cream. It's not talking about uniformity. It's talking about unity. It means this. We are like-minded. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe Jesus is the only way of salvation. We believe He arose from the dead. We believe there's a real hell and a real heaven. We look at the world through a biblical worldview. It means we agree about all those things. We have a oneness of love, having the same love. It doesn't mean we have a big group hug every time we see each other. We have the same emotions about things in life. It means this, the love of Jesus that flows into us, flows out of us, and we love the way Jesus loves, and we love what Jesus loves. Being of one accord, it means to be one 
spirited or one souled. It literally means supernaturally, we belong to Jesus and we belong to each other, that God has joined us together as the body of Christ. And then one mind means oneness of purpose. It means we know why we're here. The reason we are here is the mission, the great commission Jesus has given us to make disciples of all nations for the glory of God, to point people to Jesus so that they might be saved. Folks, God desires unity in the church. Satan hates unity in the church. And I am convinced this world, our community, desperately needs to see unity in the church. Have you ever thought about how insane it is that people who claim to love God and know God, who gather in God's name, all they can do is fuss and fight with one another when they're surrounded by people who are lost and dying and going to a devil's hell forever? It's insanity. Absolutely crazy. The greatest advertisement for First Baptist Arnold about Jesus is not our digital sign, it's not social media post, it's not our website, it's not handing out cards, that's all cool. The single greatest advertisement for Jesus in this church is how you and I love each other. Jesus said that in John 13, 35, the world will know we are his disciples by how we love one another. You know why so many churches fuss and fight and feud and don't have unity? Rarely is it a theological issue. If it's a theological issue, you need to be divided. If there's someone that comes along and says there's other ways to heaven than to Jesus, you know, as Adrian Rogers said, it's better to be divided over truth than united over error. But that's not the reason. The reason most churches have disunity is because of selfish, proud baby Christians who want everything their way, the way they want it, the way they like it. It's all about them. Serve them. Do all these sorts. It's all about them. Hey, I know everything in this church is probably not the way you like it. Everything in this church is not the way I like it. But since when, why does it matter what you like or I like? All that matters is what he wants. It's always personal preference. When I was in high school, I worked for this janitorial company. Actually, my brother-in-law did, and they had big projects. So sometimes on a Saturday to make some extra money in high school, I'd go help them just do labor stuff. And we would strip and seal cement floors. You know how a cement floor, if it's got that real shine on it, we would pour this chemical on the cement floor, run these buffers, then you mop it all up, let it dry. We had these high-pressured sprayers that had this glue-like chemical in it. You'd spray on the concrete and take these little lambskin brush things and smooth it all out real nice and shiny. Well, one day we were working, I think it was at a Rawlings plant or something, and I was pumping up the high-pressure sprayer, and the high-pressure sprayer blew up in my face. You're saying, that's what happened to your face. We've been wondering all these years, what, now you know, man. A, and I mean, this glue chemical stuff went in my eyes, went in my mouth, just all over me. The guys hurried up and got me on one of those eye wash stations and began to wash my eyes, and they jetted me out to an emergency room. I think it's maybe the first time I've ever been to an emergency room in my life. And that emergency room was amazing. I saw this receptionist who was there to meet me. She passed me off to this, like, the secretary of the floor who assigned me to a room and a doctor came in and an eye specialist came in and everyone at emergency room worked together in unity. They put my interest ahead of theirs and my eyes are okay. What if when I got in the emergency room, they were like a lot of churches and have disunity? What would have happened if they selfishly put their interest ahead of mine or they were just not getting along? Let's say I walk into the emergency room, and there's that receptionist behind the desk. Oh, she'd have been nice. She'd have put up a good front. Hi, how are you? Oh, okay. But see, she needs to pass me off to the, the floor secretary of the emergency room, and they're not talking to one another because the floor secretary got invited to this baby shower that she didn't get invited to, and she knew the baby shower lady before this other lady did, so now they're mad at each other. So I'm sitting there with glue all over my face, and then... The secretary needs to get me in a room, but she needs to talk to the doctor about what room they want me in because of my eyes. But you see, she's a little ticked at the doctor because under his doctor's smock, he stopped wearing dress slacks, and now he's wearing jeans. And she thinks it's disrespectful in the emergency room. 
And I'm sitting there with glue in my eyes, and two nurses walk by, and they see me, but they're so preoccupied with, oh, my allergies are so bad this year. I, all they're doing is talking about themselves, and I'm just sitting there with glue all over my face. And then the, the doctor, well, him and the eye specialist need to work together, but this eye specialist, he's really, really good. He got this award and got recognized, and the doctor's a little jealous of him, so they're just kind of... And the eye specialist, they say, we don't know if the eye specialist is going to show. He, I mean, the eye specialist was here every day, but he's, sometimes the eye specialist doesn't come anymore because one of the nurses changed the music in the break room, and he doesn't like the music. So he stopped, the eye specialist stopped coming. Frank Sinatra may be old blue eyes. I'd be old glue eyes today if they didn't get along with each other, okay? I'm thankful that they put my needs and my interest ahead of whatever's going on in their words, they work together. Here's what happens in an emergency room. The people that staff an emergency room have a unity of purpose. They selflessly work together to help the hurting and save the sick and the dying. That's exactly what the church is about. We have a unity of purpose. It's not about what I want, what I like, serve me, those sort of things. We put others and Jesus ahead of ourselves. We put ourselves in the back seat. We have a unity of purpose, which is advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ so lost people can be saved. And we selflessly work together with all of our differences, all of our preferences. We put all that in the back seat to help the hurting, so many hurting people around us and the sick and the dying, people all around us, nations who've never heard about Jesus. We don't focus on ourselves. We have the motive and we have the methods for unity. Let's go on. The second lesson for living, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. The selfless life requires humility. In verses 1 and 2, Paul, you're a great church. Stay a great church. You've got to have unity and harmony. And now in verses 3 and 4, it says, here's how you have unity. You've got to have humility. I believe if you could somehow make an x-ray machine that could take an x-ray of the heart of a great, united, gospel-centered church, let me tell you what you'd find. You'd find humility. Again, I've been here almost 19 years. We've got about 50 deacons in this church. Let me tell you about the deacons at First Baptist Arnold. They are humble men and women. They're wives. The leaders in this church, some who have been here for generations, 20, 30, 40 years. I, I've discovered it my first six months here. How, see, we've had unity for over 50 years. How does that happen in a church? Because the, the leaders and so many of those in this church family are just humble people. There's humility. So we see here in verse 3, in humility, this is how we're to see others. This is how you have unity in the church. We see others. Where it says, let nothing be done. That means not one single thing. Never. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. That means don't seek personal gain. Don't always be the smartest person in the room that's got to push your agenda. Or conceit. It means don't seek personal glory. Don't have such a high view of yourself. And here it is, but in lowliness of mind. That's it right there. Lowliness of mind. That's a way to say humility. Humility is really easy for Christians to understand. Here's, here's how it works. If I truly see the greatness of Jesus, I'm going to see the littleness of me. And that's going to drive me to dependency and submission to Christ. And I'm going to go through life low lying, man. I'm going to lie low. I'm not going to be high-minded. The Bible is so clear about that. Micah 6, 8, we're called to walk humbly with our God. Ephesians 4, 2, talking about a worthy walk, it says it happens with all humility. Listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Notice it says each, but in lowliness of mind, let each. In verse 4, we're going to see we find the word each. Paul wants them to know, hey, listen, this is more than just what the congregation does. Each and every believer is to live a selfless life that brings unity and humility in the body of Christ. Esteem others as better than himself, and that's what we've talked about. You put others ahead of you, others ahead of me. 
We put others ahead of ourselves because we know Jesus is ahead of us and we know Jesus is the head of everything. And what he's saying here in verse 3, this is how we see other people. When we're Christ-centered, we won't be self-centered, we'll be other-centered. Verse 4, so verse 3 is how we see others in humility. Verse 4 is how we serve others. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now, notice what it says. It says, we do look out for our own interest, okay? This is not saying we don't look out for our own interest. We do look out for our own interest. Hey, look out for your own interest. Wear a seatbelt. Look out for your own interest. We really appreciate if you brush your teeth every day. Look out for your own interest. Read the Bible. Look out for your own interest. Pray. So this is not saying we don't look out for our own interests. Of course we do. What this is teaching us, we do consider ourselves, yet we view others with more consideration than we give ourselves. And we see that in verse 4 where it shows us how we're to serve others. If you look in verse 4, it says to look out. I love that word look. This is how we're to look at other people. That word look is where we get our word. It's the word scopus, where we get the word scope. And it's not talking about green mouthwash. It's talking about what sits on top of a rifle. Have you ever looked through a scope before? When you look through a scope, it does three things. Number one, it brings things closer. It magnifies. Number two, it makes things clearer. It focuses. And number three, it centers things. It's the target in the crosshair. Closer, clearer, and centered. What a description of a selfless life that puts others first. What I am centered on what I want to bring closer into my heart and my life, and what I want to see clearer is not me and my needs, but the needs and the interest of other people. To put them ahead of me. It's normal if you walk by a mirror or walk by a car window, it's normal for us to glance at ourselves. We all do it. You, know, you just glance at yourself. Is my hair sticking straight up on my head? Do I got jelly on my face, spinach in my teeth? Does my new shirt fit right? Whatever it would be. It's normal to glance at yourself in a mirror, glance at your own reflection. There are some people in our culture today that would say, if you really want to be emotionally, mentally healthy, you need to not glance at yourself. You need to gaze at yourself. Have you heard, I'm not making this up, have you heard of mirror gazing meditation? Mirror gazing meditation because it's all about you and it's all about, everything's about you and, you know, you're number one and you need to know that and believe all that. So get in front of a mirror, set a timer for 10 minutes, and stare at your reflection, but stare into your own eyes for 10 minutes. I'm weirded out just talking about it. (laughs) And as you stare into your own eyes for 10 minutes, don't take your eyes off your eyes in the mirror. Listen to your deep inner voice and your inner promptings. And keep staring at yourself for 10 minutes. Because it's about you. It's about you being the best you. And then I would say when you're done mirror gazing meditation, probably be good to go down and have breakfast, cereal. How about cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? Because that's nuts. Okay, that's crazy. Hey, absolutely. See, our culture wouldn't say stare. Most of our culture would think that's silly to do it anyway. But our culture would say how they live their lives. Man, don't stare into your own eyes for 10 minutes. Never take your eyes off yourself. Because it's always all about you. How does everything affect you? Who is supposed to serve you? Who's supposed to help you? Who's supposed to talk to you? Who's supposed to be there for you? It's always, always about you. Stare at yourself. Gaze into your own eyes. Get in touch with the deep, real you, because it is all about you. The Bible has a different plan. Absolutely. Who we are in Jesus Christ matters. He loves you. You're created in the image of God, and you are precious to Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, don't waste your time staring at yourself. That's what Paul's teaching us here. Stare at Jesus. Stare into the eyes of the one who loves you the most, who created you and who made you. And what happens any time we take our eyes off of our self and we stare at Jesus, it will always bring humility. And when it brings humility, then we're in a position to hop in the back seat and say, I care more about you than anything in my life. It's not about my needs. 
It's about how I can meet your needs. You see, the lovely Christian is a lowly Christian that puts others first. There must be humility for the church to have unity. So, verses 1 and 2, a selfless life brings unity. But verses 3 and 4, a selfless life requires humility. And now, Paul says, let me give you an example. Verses 5 through 11, the selfless life is a Christ copy. Verses 5 through 11, many people believe, is a hymn that the early church used to sing. Verses 5 through 11 is one of the richest, deepest parts of the Bible that talk about Jesus that we're not even going to scratch the surface today about. But basically Paul is saying this, our motivation for a selfless life is the selfless life of Jesus. We are to imitate the humility of Christ. For unity in the church, Paul is saying we've got to have humility. And guess what? Jesus didn't think about himself. He put you and me ahead of himself when he came here. He put us first. And that's what we're to be like. Verse 5 says, let. Look at that first word, let. If you go up back up quickly to verse 3, you're going to find the word let two times. If you go to verse 4, you're going to find the word let one time. Now in verse 5, it starts with the word let. That word let means let it be so. That means four times in three verses, Paul uses the word let because this is what he's teaching us. It's a choice. See, if I'm going to be selfish or selfless, it's a choice I make every day. My attitude is a choice. He says, let it be so or we won't let it be so. In our marriages, in our homes, at work, at school, either it'll be all about us. I'm going to do this thing, my mind, or I want to have the mind of Christ and I want to be selfless like Jesus. He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Basically what he's saying here is have this attitude of Jesus. Have the attitude of Jesus. Seek with all your mind and your heart to have this attitude. And summing up verse 5, this is how we're to follow the example of Christ. He's saying this, if Jesus was living my life, how would he live it? When you go to work tomorrow at 8 o'clock and you interact with your other workers and the customers, if Jesus was living your life, how would he live it? How would he treat them? How would he see them? What would he do? When you walk into chemistry class and you're in a group of five people doing a project and three of them are real knuckleheads, how would he see them? What, if Jesus was living your life, how would he live it? When, Jesus come, if, when you come home to your family or to your spouse, if Jesus was living your life, how would he live it? That's what Paul is saying here. That's why we've got to be in the Word I mean, only through the Bible can we see how Jesus lived and how the Bible wants us to live. It's why we've got to pray. I mean, we desperately need God to give us the attitudes and actions of Jesus. It's why we've got to surrender. We can't do this, but the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. But we won't be in the Word. We won't pray. We won't surrender until we're humble. Verses 6 through 8, who being in the form of God. See that in verse 6? That literally means who is the very essence of God. Jesus is not like God. Jesus is God. And when Jesus came to this earth, he was 100% man, 100% God. And he didn't, set, he didn't stop being God. He set aside his rights as God. And he glorified the Father by fulfilling his mission of dying on the cross for our sins and coming out of the grave alive. It says, who being in the very form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Look at verse 8. And being found in the appearance as a man, he, he humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself for you and for me so we could go to heaven. He lowered himself for you, for me. We had no hope. He didn't make it about him. He made it about you and about me. And became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus willingly put himself first by lowering himself. He humbled himself. Jesus went from the highest position we can even fathom in verse 6. The glories of heaven. His ways are higher than our ways. How can we even begin to describe how high Jesus is in the glories of heaven? And he lowered himself. He humbled himself. He went down, down, down for you and for me to the lowest position possible in verse 6, being dead in a borrowed tomb. 
Jesus in the glories of heaven because he loves you and loves me because he put you and me ahead of himself because he didn't put his own interests first because he put us first in a selfless, humble way. Jesus went down from the glories of heaven to be born in a manger of Bethlehem. And then he wasn't done. He, went, he lowered himself and went down to be rejected by the people he loved and he came to serve. He didn't stop there. He lowered himself. He went down on his knees when he washed the feet of the disciples. He went down when he lowered himself and allowed himself to be arrested and go through a mockery of a trial. He went down when he allowed the people he created to beat him, pull out his beard, and spit upon him. He went down when he was crucified on a cross, and he lowered himself and went down when he was dead in a tomb. And what Philippians 2 is screaming at you and screaming at me, and it is so incredibly convicting and challenging, is this one question. If Jesus lowered himself like that for you and for me can we not lower ourselves for others if Jesus lowered himself from the glories of heaven to dead in a tomb not himself first but for you and for me can you not lower yourself for your husband or your wife you always have to be right it's always got to be about you can you, if he did that for us, can you and I not lower ourselves to keep unity in the church so the gospel can go out and lost people don't die and go to hell? Can we not do that ourselves out in this lost world, always in line with Scripture? Even when people mistreat us or hateful to us, can we, he did that, can we not do that? That's what Paul's saying. He went down from heaven to a manger, to washing feet, to a cross, to dead in a tomb. But aren't you glad he didn't stay down? Look at verses 9 through 11. He arose. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of the Father. Highly exalted means to super elevate. It means to be lifted up to the highest ultimate position. Verses 5 through 11 is like a big letter V. He went from the highest position possible to the lowest position possible. And then guess what? He arose from the dead. And guess where he is today? He's back in the highest position possible. Jesus didn't exalt himself. Notice that. He could have. But God the Father exalted him. Because when God the Father exalted him, it's God's way of saying, I accept the payment of your blood on the cross to set people free from their sins. And anyway, when God the Father exalts God the Son, it glorifies God the Father because Jesus is God. There's a great lesson here for you and for me, what Paul is teaching them about unity and harmony in the church through humility, and Jesus is our example. It's a great principle we see all throughout the Bible. The way up is the way down. That's the principle. You want your marriage to go up? You'll be willing to go down. Want to keep unity and love in the church? Want it to go up? Humble yourself and go down. In all areas of life, it's, it's in the Bible, the way up is the way down. When we willingly lower ourselves, the Lord lifts us up, not for our glory, but for his glory. We see it all throughout Scripture. Remember those words, humble, exalt? Listen to James 4.10. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. In Luke 14, Jesus told a parable about not being proud, but by taking a low place in life. And he said in verse 11, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Remember in Luke 9 where the disciples were having this big knockdown, drag out argument about who's going to be the greatest? Jesus told them that, hey, if you want to be greatest in my kingdom, the path is through humble, sacrificial service. The way up is the way down. When we lower ourselves and live a selfless life like Christ, The Lord lifts us up. It not only blesses other people, he blesses us. When our life is like John the Baptist in John 3.30, it's all about he must increase and I must decrease. 
This is what's so incredible. When we lower ourselves and we lift up Jesus, Jesus lifts us up right along with him. We're blessed. And ultimately, folks, he's really going to lift us up because one of these days he's going to lift us up to heaven. Eye hasn't seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Jesus' humiliation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his exaltation, back up, highest position. There's one more step, and it's his adoration and confession. Let me read it again, verses 9 through 11. Let's let these words soak into our hearts. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you believe Jesus is Lord? You will, now or later. You will. There's coming a day when all creation is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. But only those who willingly come to him and confess him in this life are those who are saved. It says that all will confess him. Every tongue will confess him as Lord. It says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. It's just really this simple. Everyone will confess Jesus as Lord. If I confess him as Lord on this side of the grave, I have salvation in heaven. If I confess him on the other side of the grave, it's separation and it breaks my heart, but it's a real place called hell. Where do you stand? Which side of the grave are you on? You know what will keep you from confessing him as Lord? It's what we've talked about this whole message. It's called pride. My religion, I'm good enough. I believe God's real. Me, a sinner, separated from God. But man, he loves you so much. We already talked about how he lowered himself. He did that for you and for me because he wants to spend forever with you. And if you'll admit your sin and turn to him, if you'll confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he'll forgive you and he'll save you. I hope you do that today. Well, where we started was people getting on elevators, seeing someone coming and hitting the closed door button because they don't want to wait and don't want anyone to get on board with them. Here's an interesting elevator fact for you. Do you know that most elevator closed door buttons do not work? You're saying, I always knew that. It's true. Most elevators in the United States, the closed door button is there. The closed door button is maybe lit up. The closed door button maybe clicks when you push it, but the vast majority of them are non-functioning. They've either been disconnected or they don't function. It all goes back to the 1990s and disability laws. Our government passed a federal law about the amount of time an elevator door has to remain open. So what elevator companies began to do is either made the closed door button where it doesn't function or they just disconnected it. So that guy's sitting there pushing that button, trying to go, ha, 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 it's not even working in the first place. But here is what is good is that the open door button, it's supposed to work in all of them. And that's a, probably a, a good way to wrap up our time together. Because when you love Jesus, and if we truly love our neighbors, man, the door's open. We're all about that open door button. We open up our lives to others. And a selfless, humble life that brings unity into the church, we have disconnected the closed door button. Okay, we've disconnected that. That's not what we're about. Because Jesus disconnected it. He opened the door wide so you and I could be saved. He's our example. Next week, we're supposed to shine like stars in the night sky. What an incredible thought.